tomorrow. Okay, so good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> to start off with, would you just like to say your name and where you are? Well, I'm in Florida and I'm Eleanor Greenberg. Okay. Um, the first question that we have for you, as you may already know, is uh, it's kind of the big existential question of who are you as a person or as a human being? And you can talk about interests, passions, qualities, values, whatever you'd like. Well, I actually think of me as a group, even though I don't have DID, I have lots of sub <laughs> cells and they're interested in different things. And they even listen to different music parts of me. So I have very broad ranging interests ranging from gestalt therapy to all sorts of therapies that I would be studying if I had the time. I'm a professional student. Mm -hmm. And when I study thing and become fairly expert in it, and then I teach it. And then I write about it. And then I learn and study something else. And I'm always studying. And I always end up teaching. What I found out about myself that was really a surprise is I like really long projects. And that was unexpected. Nobody in my family was a long project person. We were all very impulsive, spontaneous. I am impulsive and I say yes to most things and then find out what I uh, regret or need to th have thought of later. But I'm, my fallback is sure, let's try that. I like going on people adventures. I like to meet people. I like strangers. I, I'm in a condo we have on Longbow Key, Florida. And this is becoming our main residence with our secondary residence, my old home in New York. And that was a surprise. I didn't think we would be moving down here so soon. And we decided to become Florida residents so we could vote against Trump in Florida where people were voting for Trump. Whereas in New York, it, that wasn't the only reason, but that was a major reason for speeding it up plus COVID. Mm. Every seven to 10 years, I retrain in something new. It usually overlaps with me teaching stuff that I already know. Mm -hmm. And I'm in my spare time, I'm inventing a short-term therapy for narcissistic personality disorder for self-aware narcissists who, don't, who really want to have a shorter therapy. Mm. And that's um, occupying me. I'm also doing a course on personality disorders informally in bits and pieces on Quora and Psych2. Mm -hmm. And I find that there are people who are writing me there and asking questions who are using this as group therapy. Right. And so it's a huge experiment and I'm having enormous fun with it because I'm very, as I said to you, I'm a private extrovert. I like talking to people, I like meeting people, I like seeing people. I don't particularly want my face everywhere unless it's work related and I need it. Mm -hmm. So um, it was interesting for me to find that out about myself. I didn't know those things until I had the opportunity and realized, well, I don't have headshots. I don't have formal pictures. I don't have selfies. I just, mm -hmm. you know, when I work, uh, maybe someone will take my picture too you know, as part of the, the training. As a group memories, right? I'm still finding out who I am. I'm 75. I was 75 January 22nd. I'm born in 1945. And um, I, what my goal with work was to have something that was fun to do. I wanted to blur the line between work and play. And I've successfully done that. So there really isn't any difference in my life. I do what, it was either become a belly dancer or become a psychologist. Those were the two choices I was weighing and it seemed a bit more logical. I'd have a longer career and I'm more, uh, you can be a therapist for forever. So it, I really- in, in theory, you could be a belly dancer for forever. Well, it's really hard and I started late, but it was really fun. Hmm. I studied with Serena Stairway to Stardom School of Belly Dance. And I'm also a psychology consultant for the Tarot School of New York. And that's one of my interests. And I'm a member of BOTA, which is a Western mystery tradition school for correspondence. 
15 to 30 year correspondence class in Kabbalah, transformational alchemy, um, astrology, things like that. And I'm, my hobby, you could say, was outcasts and pre-psychoanalytic systems of personal growth, including all the spiritual ones. That is quite the hobby. Yeah, I've always had a hobby about outcasts because mm -hmm. I felt like an outcast and um, people were very interesting to me. Irving Goffman wrote a book called Stigma that I found mm -hmm. in graduate school. And I was always the kid who was best friends with somebody nobody else um, was, felt, found appealing very often. Mm -hmm. And I could, I was curious. I go on people adventures. I don't want to climb Everest. I'm not strong enough to run marathons. When I want an adventure, I take on new groups of people and do mm -hmm. things. That sounds kind of like this project. Yes, and if I could say what my goal personally for myself was, was to help people to make a difference, be kind, work for human dignity, and be a sheltering tree for uh, people who needed shelter. Hmm. And I came up with the phrase that I would like harmless power for myself, meaning I don't want anyone to be harmed. This isn't the kind of power where you dominate people or you destroy them or you hurt them or you push them around, but it's the power to shelter them, the power to get ideas across, the power to be a positive force in people's lives and in my own life and my children's lives and things like that. So that interests me. And I had a tarot artist, I have a book out that is actually, <laughs> It was supposed to be my easy book. It was a collection of published, peer, mostly peer-reviewed articles. So I said, oh, lots of people are putting together in Gestalt world articles. And I have lots of articles, so well, I just put them in a book. And then I got a tarot artist, Robert Place, to do the cover for me because I knew what I wanted. I wanted symbols borderline narcissistic and schizoid adaptations that none of, nobody would be ashamed to have. And I have a sheltering tree, two trees, to be the shelter, represent the shelter that's necessary for people to grow. And I have a heart, red heart for borderline, gold star with, for my narcissistic clients. And I would have had a gold and silver star, but it really didn't work on the cover. Silver for cloth, narcissist, don't want to be seen. Right. Reflection like the moon of the sun. And then I have an antique key for the heart and the handle for my schizoid clients who want their privacy. They want some control over their lives. They've been intruded upon. So I like to integrate my interests. So that integrated the world of tarot and symbolism and pre-psychoanalytic systems of personal growth because these cards I use are very psychologically minded, but they're really drawn in 1910. And I found that they had the principles of modern psychology embedded in them, which fascinated me because there's CBT embedded in Key 12 in the Rider Waite Smith deck and the principles. So anyway, I am usually into something odd that other people think is really quirky. And that's going to, as, as my daughter has said, my husband has said, that's going to ruin your brand. I said, my brand is what I say it is. It's what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. And it'll either suit some people or it won't suit them. And they'll want somebody else to be their therapist or their tarot person. And I present at tarot conferences, I teach uh, tarot readers. I do continuing ed in psychology for tarot readers because a lot of people go to tarot readers instead of therapists. Right. And the really smart ones know that they're sometimes dealing with things that are over their head and that people become very dependent. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, kudos to Robert Place, the tarot artist, um, who did my cover for my book. And he's a historian and an expert in Renaissance uh, tarot and Renaissance parades and alchemy and things like that. And he had stopped me in a tarot conference once to ask me a question about a client of his. And he said, you really, we really need you in tarot land because we're getting all these people and we're doing 
quasi therapy with them sometimes because some of the tarot methods are very similar mm -hmm. and present scented. So I spread myself around. I'm in tarot world, I'm in gestalt world. I studied as an object relations uh, theorist and therapist. I studied Ericksonian hypnotherapy and group therapy and other things. And this is what I do for fun and Tai Chi. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So well, another question that we have, which will sure will bring out more parts of you, even more of the many parts, um, is whether you identify uh, an event or a set of circumstances in your life that have shaped who you are, that have had some kind of important impact. Yes, um, I have so many of them, but the, uh, for various reasons, my family fell apart when I was around 14. And by 16, I was homeless on the streets of New York, crashing where I could, literally homeless with the clothes I had on my back, which didn't include a winter coat and it was a cold winter. And I, was, I found Greenwich Village because I was working the whole time and um, going to, trying to find safe crash pairs. And that was the folk music time. Mm -hmm. And it was, I loved the music. So I worked, I worked at lots of jobs. I worked my way through my bachelor's in, in school. I worked my way later on through my master's. I was always working to support myself pretty much from 16 on. And from 16 on, I didn't live with another adult who I wasn't dating. <laughs> That's what <I'm> <laughs> you know, or maybe I did for part of the time to just to get uh, a little, someone to sign a lease, you know. So it's being on the streets of New York and realizing that it was easier than being with my parents that homeless was better for me, that I could take better care of myself, even though it was a bit, it wasn't as dangerous as being in some of the high schools I was in. I went to about five of them. And some of them were, uh, people could be a little violent and mean and things like that. And I've been to school and I've been, I'm a Jew in Catholic school, St. George's in Cuba during the revolution. I went to Monticello High School, Miami Beach High School three different times, George Washington Night School, Way Junior High School. I graduated from Fort Lee High School and I'm probably leaving out some other schools that I went to. I really knew nothing except how to read really well because when you keep skipping schools. So I found myself listening to folk music, really loving it, really loving guys with guitars, steel string guitars. And I found I was a really good at surviving. And I always knew I could um, see people and, keep, and see their energy kind of and know if I was safe or unsafe. I was only unsafe when I didn't trust that, when I couldn't read somebody, it turned out I was unsafe. So that year was really a great adventure. And I saw people get hooked on heroin. I saw people become prostitutes. I saw people become, uh, do dangerous things. And I, managed, I knew I needed to avoid all those things. And I passed the kitty basket for lots of guitar players. And I still love a lot of the, that music today. It was really my music. And it was the first music I really liked really well because I didn't, I'm born in 1945, I found it really boring and the 50s awful because there were good girls and bad girls and I wasn't either. Hmm. And I really didn't fit in. And I had to pretend, one, you had to do a certain amount of pretense and I didn't like it. I would have rather just been myself. But when I'm myself, people mistake me because I wasn't born with the hypocritical piece or judgmental piece super. Mm. So I found that when I told the truth, I found out at age seven that people really lie a lot. A little girl asked me did, uh, how babies were born. Uh, she had a very common name, so I'll say it because I don't think, and Lucy Brown, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so I told her because I had just heard from my older stepbrother at that time about what I thought he said was interquas. So oh. I didn't know how to spell it. You know, I had him spell it. He explained where penis went in vagina and things like that. And I thought, wow, 
Um, so that's what that does. So when Lucy asked me, I told her, well, this is what my older brother said. And she went home and told her mother that her mother, I said, what did your, she says, my mother told me something different. I said, what did your mother say? She said, I was found under a cabbage leaf. And I said, Lucy, how did you ever get under a cabbage leaf in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, it's critical I, it thinking and teaching as a seven year old, right? Yes, you know, I was always very psychologically minded and I'm very analytical and uh, spontaneous about it. So it made no sense to me. And I said, well, if your mother told you that, you should really check with your mother. And so she went and her mother wouldn't let her play with me again and oh. told her I was a liar. And that, yes, she was found under a cabbage leaf, and I had no right to tell her anything different. So that was what I, what I really learned that uh, grown ups lie and they want you to lie, and they, people are hypocrites about lots and lots of topics. And I continued to learn that people are, they are hesitant to actually talk about what they're really thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. When I became a therapist later on, all of my background was very, very handy for me because I had an opportunity to ask questions. They were paying me to ask questions to tell me about what they were thinking and feeling mm -hmm. in the most honest way possible. And I loved it and I wanted to help. So I think the year on my own and the year after that semi on my own, um, it, was very helpful to me. And I bonded with, I bond easy. It's really simple for me. And I'm quick to like people if, they're, if we, we, we share a common energy in a bond. So mm -hmm. I would bond with people in Grange Village and they were homeless or outcasts or throwaway kids or runaway kids. And the runaways were runaways for a reason. And then there were these some older people who, older, they were in their 20s, or they, the oldest I knew was 33. Mm -hmm. And so the girls and most of the kids were 16, saying they were 21. Right. And then you had some people who really were, um, came from other backgrounds and had money and had rent for an apartment and things like that. So it was two worlds. It was at the same time. That, that at that time I was in the homeless world and now I'm in a very comfortably off world where I'm on Longboat Key in Florida. My husband plays golf and it's hilarious to me because I'm still the same person. My hobby from around age eight on till sometime in my teens was lepers. 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 I read every book in the library. They gave, they let me into the adult library with my mother's permission at around eight. And so I read all the books on lepers, novels about lepers, uh, biographies of lepers, biographies of people who took care of lepers, biographies of how you get leprosy, how they found out they were in the barber chair. You saw a white spot behind their ear, Hansen's disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that came from the historical drama, The Robe, that I saw as a kid. It's a Christian historical. Mm -hmm. And someone's in a cave, imprisoned because of their religion. And they come out of the cave, and you don't really see them on screen, but you see their family mm -hmm. stopped, saying, oh my God, and they're horrified. She has leprosy. And so I immediately want to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, I'm reading everything. So after a while, I read, I knew I The Leper of St. Giles. You know, I read all the books that I could find. And then I was also simultaneously interested in people who had some power over their own lives and did interesting things. So my two other hobbies at that time was Jim Bowie, who died at the Alamo, which I, not because he died at the Alamo, but because he invented the Bowie knife. And I wanted to be okay. a pro when I was young but nobody would teach me. They kept giving me doll dishes. Oh. And I found dolls creepy. I liked puppies, I liked stuffed animals, I liked knives, but they didn't want to give girls. This was the 50s. Boys could play mumbly peg and girls were given dolls. And so, you know, it was, I had to wait. I wasn't comfortable until the mid to late 60s when I could be a hippie. That was mm -hmm. the closest I came to my comfort zone of people. Mm who were egalitarian, 
friendly, warm, wanted to do good in the world, and weren't so judgmental, and I didn't have to wear underwear. So all of that was good. I didn't have to wear clothing, nobody cared what you wore, nobody cared how much money you had, and it was a very, very nice time for me. So all of that stuff affected me, meeting all these people. I had lots of people with mental illness in my family, which also affected me, and I loved them. They were really nice people, and they, many of them were functional despite all sorts of problems, ranging from psychosis to psychopathy to OCD to multiple things like a narcissistic personality disorder with histrionic features with severe OCD and still lovely and functional. So when I started practice in 1974, I hadn't studied personality disorders, but I had plenty of them in my family and I knew lots and lots of people, but I didn't know what one was formally. I didn't know the names for these things yet. Mm -hmm. The only one I knew the name for, a friend of mine in college got the diagnosis. He came home after a visit to a clinic with, a with an envelope sealed and he wasn't supposed to unseal it. He was supposed to hand it to the therapist who was referred to it had his diagnosis. So, they brought it to me because I was majoring in psychology at Columbia and I was the only person they knew who would answer psych questions. And they said, we're going to steam open the envelope and you're going to explain Michael's diagnosis to us. I said, okay. So I looked at it and it said he was a pseudo neurotic schizoid with sociopathic tendencies. Well, we were horrified. What does that mean? That sounds terrible. It sounds miserable. This is Michael. Michael, he was gay. He loved the Ring trilogy. He was funny. He was sarcastic. He didn't seem terrible. You know, he was one of the bunch. Mm -hmm. So that got my interest. I wanted to know what did that mean? And now I know what it means. That in my first year of therapy got me very interested in personality disorders because I thought that um, that kind of labeling was scary. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that pseudoneurotic schizoid with sociopathic tendencies probably meant that, I looked it up many years later when I trained in this stuff, it meant that at one point they thought people who had personality disorders were pre-schizophrenic oh. and they just looked normal. And they were waiting for them to lose their minds <laughs> and just need to be hospitalized. But that didn't happen, or it happened very rarely, only in extreme cases. And they recompensated very quickly. So uh, between the members of my family, my friends, me, uh, the people I knew, uh, I wasn't uh, predisposed to, to be against people with pre personality disorders, but I found when I wanted to study them, most everybody warned me not to and said they couldn't be helped. And they told me horrifying stories. You know, I had dated some guys who were narcissistic and I knew they weren't a walk in the park, you know, that it was hard to make a personal relationship work with them. And I might get dumped and a couple I dumped and one broke my heart, but I still didn't think they were monsters though. I knew some people who were monsters who didn't look like monsters and they often, uh, weren't as obvious as the people I knew with narcissism. So my first year in practice, I um, had a couple of people really surprise me. I expected it to be like training group. In training group and all the training I did for gestalt therapy, everybody was motivated. Everybody wanted to unveil themselves, learn about themselves. It was easy. Now I had real clients. Most of them were fine. They were like the people I had in training groups. They weren't so different. It wasn't that we were all so sane in our training groups. We were all quirky. We were all in therapy. We were all nutty. And that was fine. But I found a couple of clients that I really didn't understand who began by loving me and telling me I was saving their, saving their life and everything I was doing was wonderful. And then something, and I didn't know what, would trigger them to hate me start screaming at me, run cursing out of the room, telling me I was unprofessional. This is 1974, Gestalt therapists are taught not to diagnose this pathologizing. So I had no name for what was going on, but I thought this is a one-off, this is a fluke. How often does somebody switch from loving me to hating me like that? 
So then when the second one did it, and the third one did it, I said, this is not acceptable. I need to learn something. I'm, I know there's a pattern here and I can't see the pattern, but I know this, I'm, I, I'm big on pattern recognition and analysis. And so I knew I was seeing a pattern and I knew I had to step far back to get a look at the pattern. As a gestalt therapist, I was in close, working in the moment. And that wasn't working for these people because working in the moment never touched on the reason why they hated me. <laughs> because as soon as they switched to hating me, they just told me, well, they were justified in hating me. And sometimes they would have very strange, paranoid projections onto me as to my motives. So I went to my supervisor, a really smart woman, a diplomat in psychology, I'll give her, she's dead, Elizabeth Mintz, Betsy Mintz, very original. The only person I knew that had his training group and a supervision group that included analysts and gestalt therapists. So I knew Betsy was likely to know. So I went to Betsy and said, Betsy, I, these people, they love me, then they hate me, then they curse me, then I never see them again, then they stop the check. I have no idea what's going on. I need to know what's going on. What do you think is going on? She says, Eleanor, I have very bad news for you. Sit down. So I wonder what is she going to say? You know, so I sit down and I say, what is it, Bessie? She says, you're going to have to study with the analysts. That was no, <laughs> no, anything but the analysts. <laughs> so, so I said, what do you mean? She's, uh, who are the people that I'm asking about? She says, well, in my day, they were called character disorders. Now, then they would call personality disorders, then Masterson called them disorders of the self, etc. And I said, well, okay, but why do I have to study with the analyst? She says, they're the only ones that's interested in treating them that have methods. So you're going to have to retrain entirely while you're working. So I thought, well, I'll just take classes in this. So I went all over town taking classes. And I really sometimes couldn't understand anything they were saying. I went to one continuing ed class from the psychoanalytic program. I think it was a class on Kernberg, Otto Kernberg. It was, the jargon was so, as a gestalt therapist, I didn't know the jargon. I didn't know Otto, what object relations was. I didn't know they, anything, what they were talking about. In fact, I thought I might have gone to the wrong class and it wasn't even on. <laughs> was and I didn't I couldn't understand I just kept quiet because nothing the man said made sense to me I couldn't even ask a question then I went to Willie Mouse and White and took classes there but I didn't think that they really knew anything about personality disorders even though they were teaching it the people I saw present on borderline knew nothing that was helpful to me so I kept going along and finally I said they must know at Harvard I'm going to I was obsessed I had two toddlers. Mm -hmm. I, was, you know, I was toddlers, but I was obsessed. And I don't know why I was obsessed, but I was. And my husband went along with it. I said, I found some conferences at Harvard that were open to psychiatrists and psychologists on personality disorders. I went to hear Kernberg lecture. I figured I'm going to go there and find out. And I did many, many I'd fly up to Boston and stay for the weekend. We'd take our one vacation a year at Cape Cod where I would take one of those five day trainings because I, didn't, I saw that there were many different theories about personality disorders and I didn't know who to study with. So I took classes with, I took five days with Paul and Anna Ornstein, the self psychologist, lovely people, but I didn't think it was adequate for my needs. I took a course with the ego psychologist, Ruben and Gertrude Blank. That was very funny. Can I tell you about that? Sure. <laughs> they wrote two or three books, Ego Psychology 1, Ego Psychology 2. These books I read. I mean, I was reading books the whole time that I couldn't understand. And I was practically crying through these books. And um, their book was very complicated on ego psychology and it had charts and things. So I said, I'm going to take a class, maybe in person I can learn. And they were towards the end of their life and the end of their teaching. And they, so I expected to be taught ego psychology, but that was not what they were teaching, even though it was, it was them, the famous ego psychologists. So they came into the room. And they were about my, I'm 75, they were about my age. So it wasn't like they were 100, but they looked really old to me and they looked like they were tired. 
And they, like me, they sit in a chair, not on the floor. Most of us are sitting on the floor. And they're carrying a huge brass jeweler's scale, okay? And either a bowl of pennies or jelly beans. I can't remember which it was at this point. And they said, we're going to read, we've, we've spent years and years of our life studying these things. And what we've come down to as the most useful thing to know, is your client primitive or are they not primitive? Okay. okay, I had no idea what he's talking about, if she's talking about primitive. They give me some examples, and then they start reading histories of people, and they say, you're all going to take, let's say jelly beans, because I think it was jelly beans, you're all going to take jelly beans, and there's two sides to the scale, and I'm going to read you the history, and if they sound primitive, you're going to put the jelly bean on the left scale, and if they sound not primitive, you're going to put it on the right. And so that's what we did for five days where they explained. And by the end of it, I had a pretty good idea that what they meant by primitive were people who were splitting and low functioning. So those weren't the words they were using. And they, um, you know, had some odd features. But that was very unexpected. So I said, well, I don't think that that's going to be sufficient for my needs either, even though- It's not quite a diagnostic I, criteria. I, 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 criteria. Um, what happens if you have to diagnose someone and you don't have any jelly beans? Yeah, yeah, it was a six jelly bean problem. <laughs> yeah. It was very serious, but not as serious as 15 jelly beans. So, uh, so I continued on. I went to conferences that the Masterson Institute was putting on, James Masterson. I went to hear Otto Kernberg lecture, and he was debating Gerald um, Adler who was a very sweet man, and they were having a debate on borderline personality disorder, and they were opposites. Kernberg was very harsh, and he was talking about his, that Adler was wrong, that he really didn't know how to treat these borderline people. He doesn't see that, that what his clients, they're sadistic, they need you to be tough with them, they're, they're primitive, devaluing clients, they're, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they're very sadistic. And Adler turns to him and sweetly says, well, maybe they weren't so sadistic before they studied with you, Otto. <laughs> you know, before they were your clients. So it was mm -hmm. a very interesting, I thought that was an interesting conversation. But I read Gerald Adler's book. I read some books by Kernberg. I didn't understand Kernberg's books. I cried. I argued in the corners. I wrote things. I said, I can't study with Kernberg. He's still alive. And I thought about studying with him two years ago. And my husband reminded me that I could never understand him. And that as much as he's a master and he influenced many people, I should probably stick to people that are easier for me to uh, communicate with and feel like uh, we're clearer. And mm -hmm. besides, I had too much work to do already. If I could, I'd be studying all kinds of therapy right now. Hmm. So that's kind of how I did it. Eventually, I settled on James Masterson mm -hmm. because he was the only person I found that had three different therapies developed for the three different major personality disorders. And I had decided that what really to back up a little, I had a question, and whoever could answer this question, I was going to study with. Okay, okay. sounds like a fairy tale uh, kind of I archetype. Reading, <laughs> I was reading everybody, and I was very uh -huh. confused. And I had this book by David Shapiro called Neurotic Styles that to me sounded like personality disorder styles, and I didn't know the difference. Nobody uses the word neurotic anyway anymore, but there it is. So I wanted to know where is the line between a personality disorder borderline narcissistic schizoid and someone with just traits or tendencies and I didn't understand where do you draw the line so the people who could answer that question the best turned out to be object relations theorists which I hated the language because it was it was as bad as gestalt therapy you know here I had two things that people didn't understand you say you're a gestalt therapist and people say what's gestalt and 
that leaves us explaining structures, the German, that's gestalt psychology. No, we're not gestalt psychologists, we're gestalt therapists, but we're influenced by. So you always have to explain. Do you have that experience having to explain gestalt therapy? So now I had object relations theory, which say, why do they call them objects? Why aren't they people? So now I had two obscure therapies <laughs> that no one understood. But what was the answer that made me study with Masterson and object relations? If you had whole object relations and object constancy, which I will define briefly for who's ever listening, <laughs> did not qualify for a diagnosis of any personality disorder. That was the thing. If you had whole object relations, you could see people realistically, fairly realistically in an integrated way, in a fairly stable way, having both good and bad traits, things about them you liked, things about them you didn't like. It was simultaneously one package. And that's how you could see yourself. I know that I can't carry a tune, but I do know I'm very analytical. And if I put enough effort into it, I can really learn personality disorders, even though it takes a long time. I know that I like Tai Chi, and I know that yoga hurts my back. <laughs> so these are good and bad traits. I don't have any particular mathematical talents. I, there's lots of things I'm not talented in. I have narrow groups, but I can accept this. So this is an integrated view. Clients who have personality disorders can only see people as all good or all bad. So first they idealize, then they devalue, or first they devalue, and then if they come to like you, they idealize. But on a moment to moment, when someone they think is all good, and often I get that projected on me by clients, which is what happened that first year in 1974, I get the all good projection because I'm warm and friendly, and I like people. And then, unbeknownst to me, I say something that doesn't fit their pictures, or I let their session be interrupted for any reason. This was the UPS man test, which I'll talk about later. And suddenly they hate me. Suddenly, mm -hmm. I, now then they say, they rationalize that they were fooled by me. I seemed nice, because if you can only see people as all good or all bad, when you see them first as all good and then as all bad, people have to rationalize, why is that not their fault? Right. Why? They say, well, I have trouble seeing people in an integrated way. First, I saw you as all good. Then I saw you as all bad. Well, people with personality disorders don't see anything strange about that. They no, say it's obviously I because you were lying or you were manipulating or you were doing right. something. So um, I thought that that was a really interesting answer. And object constancy explained abuse in relationships by people who say they love you the lack of object constancy. Object constancy is, if you have whole object relations, you usually have object constancy, which means, at least to some degree, that during a fight, no matter how mad you get at your mate or your partner or a friend, you still remember that you care about them. So you don't want to really damage them. You don't hit below the belt. You might say some nasty things, but you're really careful with your phrasing. If you don't have whole object relations and you have any violent tendencies, you're likely to hit the person. You're likely to throw something at their head. A lot of people throw remotes today. I see a lot of people with, 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 with pictures of remote injuries on their head that they send me. You know, um, they're taking pictures of their injuries and things like that. And the remote just, it used to be coffee cups. Okay. And cost across the room it, near their head, sometimes hitting them, sometimes not, just the wall. So um, I've seen frying pans, coffee cups, and a few knives, like flying knives. Flying knives, that's a bad sign. Yeah, yeah, those, those were not going well. <laughs> think with a gun under your pillow, yeah, you know, it's a bad sign if they have a gun. And um, they don't have whole object relations or object constancy. So during the fight, when I used to see those stories about men who killed their wife, beat her to death, shot her, and then he's holding her in her arms saying, but I, crying afterwards saying, but I love her. I don't even understand how I did this. I really love her. That's a lack of object constancy. 
And I believe him that in his own way he loved her, but he lost object constancy. He didn't have whole object relations. So this seemed like the most important concept in the world to me because it really explained most of the abuse that I had experienced and that I was seeing my clients experience and that some of my clients were doing to other people. And so I ended up studying at the Masterson Institute and went on fac. I stayed there so long I went on faculty. And I was simultaneously working as a Gestalt therapist. Now, this was so hard and took so many years. It was about 15 years of study altogether, uh, three years just to understand what people were talking about. I bought a psychoanalytic dictionary in the hopes that they would explain this language. And it turned out it was translated from the French and it was high psychoanalysis. And of course, it didn't have object relations. So that didn't help me at all. So I made a vow and I've kept the vow. I said, as soon as I learn anything about this topic, I'm going to present it at Gestalt therapy conferences. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, my first paper was healing the borderline 10 simple steps because I wrote down in outline form 10 things I had learned that I believe to be true about borderline. I learned some of them were fake because I was mistaking certain people. I didn't understand schizoid personality disorder. Mm -hmm. So I was lumping them in. So, so I got better. And my lectures got better and my presentations got better. But I started my first presentation in 1982, I believe, for a Gestalt journal conference. And I presented for the New York Institute for Gestalt Therapy when I became a full member. You had to do some presentation and uh, Laura Pearls was alive then, Richard Kitzler and people. And it was, um, Isidore Fromm had been my teacher for theory and proposed me for membership. So I felt a little safe because Isidore was pretty much the foremost theoretician at that point and respected. So despite, um, he asked if he want, if I wanted him to read my paper before I read it, before I read it at the meeting for my that. And I said, no, it would make me too nervous because he was very precise about language. So I just decided I'm doing it. And I thought I would get a lot of flack because people weren't diagnosing. And here I was using a psychoanalytic system, ob offshoot object relations to diagnose, but I was doing gestalt therapy with the clients. And that worked out okay. And then one day, I don't know, some decades ago, finally, I had been doing it enough that I realized that we had much simpler ideas in gestalt therapy that would actually I finally integrated it. Laura told me afterwards, she said, this is fine what you did, but don't interject it, integrate it, assimilate it into Gestalt therapy. Because if you don't, you're doing Gestalt and, and that was a no-no. You have, if you really understand it, you'll be able to assimilate it into Gestalt language, which she was absolutely right. And I did, and I came up with the concept of the interpersonal Gestalt. And I found very, very simple ways to explain it using figure ground theory to explain splitting. Mm -hmm. And the basic thing I can explain in two minutes here is Gestalt psychologist study perception and how we put things together, how we hear a melody from disparate notes, how we see a triangle from three dots, why do we do this? And basically we're pattern recognition people but what patterns, they also had the Zygarnik effect and another woman who has a very long name who worked with her, who starts OS something. So I, I have to memorize Asenskaya or something. People know it in that thing. That is too much data for our senses and our brain to process, too much interpersonal data. And I realized that people were choosing their data unconsciously what they were going to make figure and what they were going to make ground based on their needs, based on basic gestalt therapy theory that we tend to focus on our unmet needs of the moment, mm -hmm. what we fear and what we long for. And so I realized that I could diagnose people by paying lots of attention to what they fear, what they long for from me, what they notice about me and what they don't. Mm -hmm. And that alternately, people with personality disorders, the splitting, the all bad, all good, they were simply two different organizations. And in one case, like that, the old woman, the young woman gestalt picture, in some cases, they were making figural all the information about me that showed I was good. 
it was a confirmation bias situation. And then when I did something they didn't like, that became background and they reorganized the picture only focusing on data that proved I was bad. And that was what was going on. And that seemed pretty simple to me. About every, everybody can understand that. And some people switch back and forth because when I do something really nice for them, some of them just switch back to liking me again. And then right. it goes, some people can hold it together for a month and some people could be every 10 minutes they'll switch on me and they won't come back. So I thought Gestalt therapy, I identify as a Gestalt therapist, not as an object relations theorist, even though I am, uh, and other things because it gave me the most freedom to be creative and to integrate and assimilate any ideas that were lacking. And sometimes there were things lacking. And almost every workshop I ever gave on Gestalt therapy, somebody would say, why are you diagnosing? That's pathologizing, giving people labels. And I got really used to explaining my story and how useful it was, and that what I was diagnosing was a pattern, not a person. The person isn't borderline. The person isn't narcissist. The person isn't schizoid. This is a, the shorthand for saying that I'm seeing a person whose behavior, thinking, coping strategies, and deficits, their pattern fits that category. And when somebody who is borderline, one of my clients said, I hate the label, I don't like being borderline. I said, fine, that's easy to fix. She was very surprised. I said, what do you mean? I said, you just stop doing borderline things and substitute coping skills that are not borderline and let, we can work on that. And she says, well, I really need self-esteem. I said, that's not so hard. She said, really? That's not so hard? I wasn't, you know, I didn't get it as a kid, what have you. I said, yes, you basically have to go and do acts that you esteem. And when you do these acts and complete them that you esteem, your self-esteem, if you take it in and allow yourself to assimilate, yes, I did this and it was hard, but I accomplished it. I said, then you will develop self-esteem. And she liked that and she did. So mm -hmm. I'm usually looking to simplify, clarify complicated concepts. That gives me a great deal of pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm letting you sort of run all of this through and I'm not interrupting you, not just because I'm sitting here nodding my head because I'm, I'm really interested in how you came through this whole process of developing this set of concepts, this perspective and this way of working. And the only thing that I would interrupt to ask you is how all of this process, and especially in Gestalt, because you said that's how you identify, has affected you as a person. Well, I realized that basically I didn't have a leader to follow. I never intended to be a leader. I always thought that we'd get some great narcissistic guy like Fritz was, who was brilliant, who wanted to be the public figure of Gestalt, and would introduce it to the public. And I could just do my work in the background, you know, get referrals and, and, and I enjoyed my work and I had no need to be the public figure of anything or the face of anything. And I used to say it when I was teaching, you know, because I was also teaching people who were in our field who were narcissists and had personality disorders and um, all sorts of things that don't worry, we need you. <laughs> We need somebody who's going to put aside having a personal life because they're not very good at it and go forward and be the face of Gestalt, but you just have to be really brilliant and you have to be charismatic like Fritz was and, and have a lot of energy to do all this work because it's a lot of work. Well, nobody really came forward. The closest who I really, really respect, who's my first Gestalt therapy trainer is Robert Resnick. And he has done more than his share of wonderful things for Gestalt therapy, being the face of Gestalt and films on Gestalt and totally respect him. Uh, but I found that he wasn't interested in personality disorders and nobody else really, there were a few people in our field that were Margarita in Sicily is, um, Norman Shubbs was interested in borderline and excellent. There was a fellow in Montreal, uh, Quebec uh, in French, who was interested in object relations in Gestalt, and he was way ahead of the curve when I went to his workshop. There's Lynn Jacobs, who does self-psychology and Gestalt. 
but um, I found that I had no one to follow. And I'd much rather be a sheep. I'm much, much more comfortable, really. It's a, really, it's more comfortable. You be the leader, just lead in the direction I want to go in. Well, I had to break off and be much bolder because there was nobody in my direction who was doing, thinking about it the way I was, all three personality disorders, because self-psychology basically focused on narcissism and empathy and had a, didn't have the object relations approach to narcissism and didn't think all object relations was a, was a necessary sign of health. And I totally agreed with that. If you, don't, if you think somebody without the ability to integrate good and bad can be healthy, then it's, it's not a necessary sign of health. Well, I have to diverge from that. So I had to diverge from self-psychology and they really weren't very good with borderline and they thought they, they were more disturbed. And then I, had, I kept diverging. And even Masterson, who I was there for a very long time, he thought you either had whole object relations or you didn't. And I, he did lots of charts. And I thought you got it slowly. And I thought I could teach people how to do it. I could write instructions. And um, so I realized that there was a real hole that I was reading all these theoretical articles that really did not interest me past a certain point in the Gestalt journals that were existing and that nobody was writing how-to articles. And I didn't even know they all wanted how-to articles or would publish my how-to articles, but I said, we need how-to articles. So I'm going to write down, I'm going to break down what I've learned to do into steps, not because you do them literally in steps, but so people can understand the steps and then they can integrate them and practice however they practice with whatever form of therapy that they do, whatever style they do it in, it would be background for them once it was assimilated. So I think you learning and then teaching, right? That's right. So then I ended up, um, becoming the public face of Gestalt therapy on, on personality disorders on Quora and on psychology today, which wasn't anything I expected, uh, nothing that I particularly sought out, and uh, it's worked out. You know, I got used to it. I got used to being different. I was always different. And I basically, here's what people told me when I set out, said I'm studying personality disorders. They said, you'll regret it. They'll sue you. You'll be broken. They'll be mean to you. You won't have any success with them. You'll be wasting your time. You're going to need more malpractice. You must be crazy. Don't do it. That's what everybody told me. And so I had to ignore what everybody said because I knew too many people with personality disorders who I liked. I still remember my friend who got that, who now I understand that he actually deserved that diagnosis more or less, except for the psychopathic tendencies. I think they only gave him psychopathic tendencies because at that time he was homosexual and homosexual mm -hmm. was still listed as a disorder. And uh, I knew lots of gay guys because my best friend was gay. And so he would introduce me to his friends. And that's how I ended up Michael, the pseudoneurotic schizoid with sociopathic tendencies. But I actually was thinking last week that it's a fairly correct diagnosis that I was so horrified with and I was so against the people who diagnosed him. I thought it was mean and now it's full circle. I understand what they were saying. The language is clear to me and um, it's kind of bizarre, but here I am and I'm, oops, sorry, let me just say. I um, have a book out, Borderline Narcissistic and Schizoid Adaptations, The Pursuit of Love, Admiration, and Safety. I renamed personality disorders adaptations because as a gestalt therapist, they're basically creative adjustments to a childhood situation. And then I, um, that was 2000, it came out September, 2016. I went to Sicily and uh, had some copies of my book. And two weeks before the elections, the presidential elections, my husband's golf partner told my husband, well, actually he told my husband two months before, but my husband didn't think to tell me. He said, tell Eleanor to go on Quora and answer questions about narcissism. So I said, okay, what's Quora? 
And I had to have no online presence. I didn't have a Facebook page. I didn't have a LinkedIn page. I had this book. My daughter, uh, my youngest, made up a Facebook page for me. Then she made up a professional Facebook page. As she said, I had to keep separate. They're not really so separate. Mm -hmm. I don't keep my professional and personal all that separate. Then I had a LinkedIn page. Then I'm writing, I'm answering questions on Quora. And I understood that I could, the people who were answering questions on Quora didn't know anything on my topic. They really were clueless. They were suffering from, they think their mate had narcissism. Some of their mates did. And they were generalizing to all personnel, all narcissists from whoever their mate was. And there was some really cool people with narcissism, self-identified, who I thought actually deserved the diagnosis on Quora, who were answering questions. And a very nice um, woman who, under fake false name, was a psychopath answering questions on psychopathy. And she was pretty convincing in that she, in that she felt that psychopathy should be differentiated from antisocial personality disorder or sociopathic because of the brain-based parts of it that had to do with the amygdala being on average 18% smaller, et cetera. So I made a lot of friends on Quora and I started seriously answering questions and teaching them about Gestalt therapy and object relations. And just basically when it entered the question, the questions weren't about object relations or gestalt therapy. So when I could, I would use it and identify it as a gestalt therapist. So now I have, through that, I got a, was invited to do a blog for psychology today. Today I got news that my interview with Newsweek in the UK was just published, which I put on my Facebook page. I'll be putting it on my other pages. Die Zeit, the German Weekly, did a feature interview with me that took a very, very long time, months and months of editing it to look spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs> look at us, we're just being spontaneous. Five or six pages in German, mm -hmm. and it turned out it was this huge thing. I was featured, it was the feature article for the cover of their uh, magazine, and um, I ended up with also in, a, in our NPR interview on narcissism, the day of the eclipse, August 17th, 2017. And through the German one, my book is being published. They, sight unseen, a batch of publishers made bids for my book. Wow. They on that die Zeit was featuring me. And then mm -hmm. I had this huge audience, and then I had all these followers on Quora and Psych Today. Oh, well, all of a sudden, for some strange unknown reason in the U.S., there's been a surge in interest in narcissism. How could that Malignant be? Malignant pathological narcissism. So um, my book is coming out in, I think, a year in hardcover in German by a division of Random House, Cosell. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to put it out in uh, Kindle, I think, a year after that. Mm -hmm. And I had to cut, they made me cut the word schizoid out of the title. They made change the title because they thought that people, the, they're, they're marketing it to the average person, not to mm -hmm. therapists. And my book is sold very well to non-therapists because I decided that um, every book that I wrote would have a glossary in which I define terms. So nobody would have to cry trying to understand what I was talking about, or I would read somebody and they define a term in chapter two, and I'd be in chapter eight, and I didn't remember what the term meant. Right. So I wrote a glossary that I call Greenberg's Glossary, and I put it at the end of the book, and I'm going to add to it. And that way, if I say anything that's too obscure, they can just go look it up in the glossary. And whether I'm right or I'm wrong in my definitions, at least I'm clear. And people can argue with them or disagree with them, but at least they'll understand what I'm saying. And that's my goal. That's, that's very kind of you. Okay. And I'm, I don't, I'm not saying that in a, in a sarcastic way. It is very kind to actually want people to understand what you're talking about. Yeah, I realized that it wasn't so much kindness, it took balls or waves, because I'm not a male, but um, it took nerve, because I thought a lot of people were trying to sound fancy and erudite. Right. And I thought that that was the motive, and that when they didn't understand something, they just used some big words. For example, I think the term comorbidity is overused uh, I'm really not a fan of the DSM-5 and their comorbidity. Everything's comorbid with everything else. It makes everything useless with their diagnosis. So why are they comorbid? How are they comorbid? What, how does the comorbidity show up? That's an interesting question. Not that they're comorbid. So I just thought that people, I would, 
I would take, I, I would do what I said I would do. And if people didn't like it or mocked me for it, then I at least was honest. So I wrote my how-to articles in plain English. Mm -hmm. The most recent one was about my failures in group, in, in group therapy as a Gestalt therapist. And all my, I taught my, I wrote from my failures and explained how to do personality, how to do group therapy with personality disorders. It's in the Gestalt Review, which is available through libraries, through college mm -hmm. libraries, and things like that. But it took nerve because it took nerve from the beginning to go against the grain, to not write just theoretical art. art. Well, I've written plenty of theoretical articles, but again, to make them in plain English and not right. to uh, make them obscure and to be clear about what I thought. And if I changed my thinking to be clear that I try and be clear, I changed my thinking. Over mm -hmm. And so what would you say has been the, the greatest challenge that you've had to go through taking this, this work where you've taken it and doing things the way you've been doing it? What, is, what has been the biggest challenge? Really just my body and growing old. My brain is fine. Um, yes. But my body, I can't, um, if I were younger, I would be, start a training institute for personality disorders. I never thought I would do that. My husband made me promise not to do any training institutes because it takes so much work. And I'm not, uh, that I'm organized in my thinking, but I'm not an administrator. But I would really do that. So really it's the limitations where I have um, I can only sit for so long. I can't sit at a computer for hours and hours. So I do my Quora answers on my iPhone, which has, which makes it careful and succinct. And I expand my Quora answers into Psych Today posts based on what people seem to be very interested in mm -hmm. and or what I think people are answering uh, carelessly or, or absolutely wrongly. An example of a wrong answer is narcissists can't be treated. There's no treatment for narcissistic personality disorder. Now, only one in 25 exhibitionist narcissists stay with therapy with me in the old days. So it, yes, they can be treated if they stay. The people who stay did well. They usually end prematurely. So I, would, I wrote an article, which I haven't rewritten for peer-reviewed journals yet, on the stages of therapy of narcissists, of the treatment of narcissists, because I thought if I broke it down into 10 stages, it would be clearer. I have written what I think are the first self-help articles for self-aware narcissists. Now, there aren't that many self-aware narcissists, but because of politics- I just, I just love that term, and I, I want like a book or an article, it's how to be a better narcissist. I think that would just really put the sales over the top. Well, I, I'm thinking of the cover for that book, which I'm planning on doing, The Survival Guide for Living with a Narcissist, provisional mm -hmm. name. It's going to have red roses, and barbed wire twined together right. as the symbol. And I don't know if it's going to be over a doorway and the door opens and you just see the ocean or you see a broken heart or something mm -hmm. or people kissing. I haven't figured that out yet. But the other book for um, the self-help book for narcissists, I realized people were really angry with the narcissists in their life. But there was no, unless they went to, it was really hard for them to find a therapist who knew how to do narcissistic personality disorder and wasn't too deeply offended by the bad behavior of the narcissist to continue treating them. You had to have really thick skin. I treated a lot of screamers in New York. Now I'm oh. treating, they would scream at me. They'd curse me. They, I mean, it was, you know, I got used to it. They'd run, I found a good diagnostic way to differentiate really quickly my narcissistic clients from my borderline and my schizoid. You want to hear it? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. I lived in New York, which now is my secondary home. My primary home is in Florida in a big townhouse. And it was lovely. We used to have tenants and gradually we took it over for ourselves as our family expanded. So there was no concierge. And it was a tough neighborhood. I had to have German Shepherd guard dogs. We had so many break-ins. Now it's a very fancy neighborhood off Central Park, lovely. And people think I'm so brilliant for having bought, but I still have a bullet hole in my bathroom window. I had to replace the front window because of a bullet hole when my kids were little. They shot into the nursery. I, you know, went after muggers with a, with a fireplace iron. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't... Um, you know, like that. So my door, when my doorbell rings, I just don't let people in. Right. I, 
I want to see who's there. Yeah, so, you're, you sound like a New Yorker. <laughs> yes. So um, I'd be working with a client. And most of the time, my doorbell never rings. It's not like I, I plan to keep things so that they don't interfere with my clients. Right. But occasionally, the UPS man or a FedEx man, somebody would ring the door and say UPS. Well, you can say you're UPS. I want to see that you're a UPS man. And my office is on the same floor as the main door. So I'd excuse myself from the client and say, just for safety's sake, I don't want to ring the person in. I need to check that they're really who they say they are. And I'd go out and do a quick check, sometimes sign for a package. I'd be back in within five minutes because they, if they have the UPS outfit and the UPS ID, that was it. Now, I was really surprised because most people, we would just go right back to talking about. I have a good short-term memory for this over the years. And I, I, I knew what they were talking about. I didn't forget. And most of my clients knew what they were talking about when this interruption came. And it was usually three minutes or so. Certain clients who all turned out to have severe narcissistic personality disorder got deeply offended and they would say the same thing to me. So if you want to hear what they said, look how the conversation went. I come back in saying, okay, let's get back to what you were talking about. And they would say, how could you do that to me? I said, I'm very sorry. Um, but the doorbell rang. They said, no, don't you? There must be some other way you can deal with it. And I said, I'm really sorry, but I can't just ring people in. And then some of them went into detail about electronic solutions to the problem, or couldn't I have someone else answer the door? Um, they didn't want their session interrupted. And I say, well, your session generally won't be interrupted. It's rarely interrupted. Um, one woman had been coming for three years without interruption. <laughs> And the doorbell rang, and now we're having the conversation. Yep. And she says, no, I think it's very uncaring of you, unprofessional, um, terrible. It's obvious you don't care about what I was saying. And um, I need you to promise me I'll never be interrupted again. Uh, you know, I would say, oh, this is, you know, I hear how important it is and how badly and painful it was for you that I got up to do the door and I'm very interested because it obviously rather triggers some deep pain of yours that probably predated this, that maybe you want to tell me why this is so important for you and why it means that to you, that I don't care about you. And they'd say, no, I don't want to talk about that. Um, it's not about anything else than you. You're a bad person. You don't care about me. And unless you promise that you will never interrupt my session again for any reason ever, and I said, I'm out of here today. And I said, well, I hear that you're really very angry. And I certainly don't want to interrupt your session. But it's not realistic for me to make that promise because I don't have control over who rings my door. If I did, I would promise you that if it was up to me. But I don't want to make a fake promise and then have a neighbor ring the door or somebody lost ring the door or a mailman ring the door. And then you'll tell me I'm a liar. So how about we agree that I will do everything in my power to schedule things so they don't interrupt you. But if we're interrupted by something, and of course I will add extra time to your session. If I, you know, there's no reason for you to lose time. And you're, so that's what I can do. And the, each time the person quit therapy. Right. And they, they would really try and bully me before they quit into this agreement. And some people quit there and then. Some people finish the session. Some people I had seen almost no times, you know, and they were quitting after a few times. Some people had seen me successfully. And it, it we were doing fine up to that point. So I found that this was diagnostic, that the only people who cared about being interrupted like that, or who cared about it deeply enough to threaten to quit therapy and bring it up and not go back to the prior topic, or who weren't willing to talk about what it meant to them, and why it made them so angry or felt so dejected, whatever it was, or disappointed, or feeling like I was uncaring, were people with narcissistic personality disorder. So it became the UPS test. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a project now. My project is the short-term treatment of narcissist personality disorder. And what I did is I've been seeing people, now you know, since 1974, 
and narcissists since then, whether I knew it or not. Mm -hmm. So I have lots of people who I know why their therapy took, the people who did stay and do therapy, it took a long time because they needed a lot of empathy. And they, many of them didn't stay unless I was highly empathic. I might have to do a year of empathic responses, which I learned how to do from Masterson and not do Gestalt therapy and not do anything else, but um, listen attentively, uh, validate their reality, which was very important to them. And it would be a long time before I could make any interventions. And when I thought about what did they talk about that made it take, this, these therapies took, uh, the shortest I ever did was three years and he left still a narcissist, but much better, but was very, very smart. And he, we didn't know he was a narcissist and we never discussed it. <laughs> Actually, that was before people knew about it. So I didn't bother with the diagnosis. I just went right into the work uh, unless, it was someone that needed to know their diagnosis because it really made things clear to them. I'm quite happy to, I see myself as a teacher. And when I get clients that are willing to learn, I will be transparent. I will explain what I'm doing, why mm -hmm. I'm doing it. And if they don't like it, we can do something else. So what I realized was that when I looked at it, people were, the, the, narc the exhibitionist narcissists in general were the ones that were taking the extra time or the malignant narcissist. And what they were doing is they were either telling stories that they thought showed them in a good light, that were very tangential and not useful to their therapy. They were blaming their spouses for everything that went wrong. They were telling me what I could do better as a human being, whereas they didn't come into therapy to improve me. Why is that the focus now? And we were spending actually little time on them. And anytime I'd focus on them, they might focus on themselves for a few minutes and I'd get a tangential story. I'd get a rationalization of why they were behaving badly and how the other person deserved it. And in fact, they were the real victim because that other person had so been, they were hypersensitive to slice these clients and that person had dared to tell them a different opinion than theirs. Right. Now, to give you an idea about a different opinion, I have people who have sent their spouses now therapy who have come, who know they're narcissists. But <laughs> one guy, a couple of women told me during the COVID crisis, when they couldn't get a lot of toilet paper, the husbands were very concerned about women's use of toilet paper because they had two uh, places to wipe. And therefore, they were using up extra toilet paper more than their share inefficiently. So they wanted to mansplain to their wife how to wipe their female parts more efficiently. Wow. Okay. Now that did not help their therapy and it didn't help their <laughs> marriage. <laughs> it certainly helps their diagnosis, but probably really, that's about it. That's right. So when you get so far that you're, that you're, so I started to make a list of rules that if we that if the people accepted these rules, the therapy might be feel a little more brutal and direct, but I could really cut off thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah. And they were in crisis. Their wives were divorcing them or the husband was divorcing the wife, whatever. And that we, I could guarantee it would shorten their therapy if they would accept my rules. And now I have a whole page of do's and don'ts and mm -hmm. I send them out. And um, because I'm not... I'm 75. I don't want to do a 10 year therapy with the first three years I'm abused. No, <laughs> not even for pay. No. Yeah. And I've only had one screamer in the last few years. And that was a woman who went screaming out of my office, cursing me as usual, really loudly. And it'd been so long since I had a screamer that my daughter came out of her studio that abuts my office, which has half of a brownstone floor to worried about me. Mm -hmm. uh, I was so used to it right and I, I could see the moment when she decided to be mad at me this woman mm -hmm. and, well, and, and what's what what switched her and for her it was a decision i saw her thinking about it and then she decided to go for it and and really like i was no good and she was screaming and she was screaming all the way down the hall to the door till she got outside and realized she didn't have a receipt for insurance Oh, and she told me she never wanted to see or hear from me again, and she would never contact me again. So now I get a very sweet, suddenly no more screaming. 
Right. I got a very nice email. It was totally under her control where she cut it. She would have made an interesting client probably because it was under her control. Mm -hmm. you know, some people, it's not under their control. But I, right. I, I could see in her eyes, like I could see in my, my second German Shepherd, Rosie. I could always see when Rosie wanted to bite someone. She would give them a look and then she'd be about to go for them and I'd have to jerk her thing. And I could see in their eyes the moment they were making up their mind. Right. And it was a very interesting thing. Then I got the sweet email about would I mind sending her a seat for insurance and she needed this and that. And I said, no problem. And that was my last screamer. Hmm. So it's not true that you've been stalked and, you know, threatened and attacked by all of these vicious, savage, primitive. No. 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 No, and you survived working with clients with personality disorders. Then. Well, I did have a stalker who was a borderline client, mm -hmm. and um, she was in therapy for stalking. Right, case a court case against her. Okay. And, you were uh, forewarned with that one then. And, and she wasn't doing evil to them. She just right. was ignoring that they didn't want her presence. Right, and she. She, she, she was playing it down and she was very, very, very smart. So I enjoyed working with her and everything went fine until one day I opened my door in the morning to get the paper and I saw a present from her out there oh. and a note. So I took it and the next session I thanked her and said presents weren't required and I preferred that she not uh, leave, come visit my house when it wasn't her session. And this was, you know, she was coming on the way to her job at seven in the morning. Mm -hmm. And she, I, she said, okay. And then the next day I went to get the paper and there was another present out there. Mm. And every day, no matter what I told her. So finally I said, you know, we, I need to terminate therapy with you because you're ignoring what I'm saying and I'm feeling stalked by you. And since you have a court case of stalking against you, not harming people, but doing this, I think it's not, it's foolish of you to do it with me. And we terminated because she refused to be whatever, for whatever reason. And um, then she had a lawyer stalk me to, to want to be a witness for her in her favor in the stalking case. So the lawyer hmm. started stalking me and calling me every single day. And I told them I would be a hostile witness, that I have an agreement with all my clients. I don't do court cases. I'm not a forensic psychologist. I don't testify. I don't get involved in divorces, except to talk mm -hmm. strategy, narcissism, et cetera. I don't testify for you. I don't write out things. And that was clear to all my clients. And so when I knew she had a court case, I said, you know, she agreed that I'm not going to be involved in her court case. Now here she was involving me in it. And it was, again, it was totally illogical because I had terminated therapy with her for stalking. So if they put me on the stand, I would have to say I terminated therapy with her for stalking. And yes, she is a stalker. And she seems unwilling to stop doing it with people that she's decided to befriend, whether they want to be her friend or not. And she doesn't listen to reason. So eventually I got them to stop. So that was my, other than people being nasty to me. That was right. all pretty much that happened. And, yeah. and what would you say is the other side for you? What is, what is your highlight? What is one of the success stories that you have experienced well, that you say, this makes it worth it, you know, I enjoyed this. Anyone that's serious about their therapy, I don't care what their diagnosis is, as long as it's within my scope. Like I'm not, I've only had a couple of psychotic clients, but they were serious. I had, and um, it, it was within the scope. What they wanted was how to adapt everyday life after the mental hospital. One right. was, or one had, one was schizophrenic and she had delusions and hallucinations, but she knew she had delusions and hallucinations and things like that. So it, she would like, and she said, That's fascinating the, stuff. Yeah. Yes. And one was schizoaffective that had really had totally flat affect. Mm -hmm. And I had a client who did well in therapy who's schizotypal, which is not a psychotic disorder, but it lies somewhere between, in my mind, the personality disorders and the psychotic disorders, because she was very paranoid and she had delusions and their schizotypal people usually are eccentric and odd and it's much more visible, their problems. So I like anybody 
that is working seriously and I'll work seriously with them. That's fascinating to me. And the successes are the people who work on themselves and they do well. Mm -hmm. And I'm really pleased. And I have some narcissists doing well. We will see. But these are people who were willing to accept. Uh, they wanted to save. The only reason most narcissists came into therapy with me was to save, was either they were in a self-hating depression and they needed to be revived. Right. Now, you know, or they were being thrown out of something that they valued, like a, a marriage, and they wanted to convince their wife or husband to keep them. And, or they were going to lose their job despite being extraordinarily smart and competent because they couldn't get along with anybody and they were devaluing people and people were complaining to HR about them. So, right. so that was what I used to get. And now I get people coming in and they had no clue. They, they're not bad guys. I'm not getting them because they're willing to work. Right. And they're willing to accept the rules and I can work with them. They're interested. They're, they, it just, they wouldn't listen to their wife. Sometimes for 20 years, they've been told. And these were not pushy real women. These were women who didn't want to scream. They, the, the guys were much more forceful or much more stubborn. And so they just ignored their wife. They said, oh, she's jealous or she's making a big fuss out of nothing until they found themselves losing their children, their home, their family. And then I would get contacted. And some of these people really could do the therapy work. And I want to tell their wives that, that if they keep up, step, don't divorce them yet. <laughs> this is a good prognosis. I know a good prognosis from a bad prognosis. And I'll tell you if it's a bad prognosis. And some people, mm -hmm. really bad prognosis. I told one woman that her boyfriend uh, was a leech and uh, there, was, there was no way he would be good. To, she was convinced he'd be good to the next one and the next one and the next one. And he was always cheating on her. And, and she had more personality disorders and she was the clingy type. And I said, no, th th nobody's going to treat him. He's not going to get better on his own. He's only going to get worse as he gets older. And he doesn't have a good prognosis because he has no interest in being real in any fashion. Maybe 40 years from now, he will get rid of him. I mean, usually therapists don't tell you to get rid of the person. This person was very, very destructive and mm. somebody needed to tell her to get rid of him. Her whole family was saying get rid of him. All her friends were saying get rid of him. Somebody professional. Somebody professional and she was willing to do some work. And, mm. and so the next person she got wasn't any good, but he was an improvement by far over this guy. She had done enough therapy and then she couldn't get rid of him even though she didn't even like the second one. And then it went on like that. So sometimes it's a lot of work, but if the person's doing the work, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And if they're not doing the work, it's boring. And that's just about what it is. And if they get, if, if they make improvements, everybody can evolve. We're building neuronal networks in the brain. That's what mm -hmm. a habit is. It's a batch of neuronal networks that fire together. Like when you drive a car, I learned to drive here as an adult in the United States. I drive on the right side of the road. I wouldn't be able to drive in the UK. I would have to bring everything that I do up into awareness that's now automatic and revisit it and do the opposite. Well, that's what it's like working with people that have to have a personality disorder, all their impulses, everything they've been doing for the last 40 years, 30 years, 50 years, 20 years, however long that they've been on the earth has been in one direction and now they can't trust it. And I call it read updating your app. You updated your iPhone, you updated your television, you, you have it hanging on the wall now. Every year you get updates, you update the computer, but you've never updated your programming that you programmed before the age of four, basically, and then mm -hmm. continue through your teen years advancing this programming. And so what I see therapy with them as we bring it into awareness, Gestalt therapists are all about awareness, you become aware of what you're doing, and then you can pick and choose yourself. What do I want to keep from this? What do I value? And what needs an update? Mm -hmm. The update will require a lot of repetitions, just like anything. If you wanted to learn guitar and you were a tuba player, it wouldn't be so easy. You'd know some music, but you wouldn't be able to translate from the tuba to the guitar. You'd have to be practicing every day. People know when they want to learn a language, they have to practice it. You can't do therapy once a week and expect 
with deep complicated problems that you're gonna get in enough repetitions. The whole process involves inhibiting the old response, bringing it into awareness, deciding if it's the right thing for the situation. And then if we've worked on different coping skills for you, choosing a more productive coping skill, and what's more productive, you like the outcome better. It's as simple as that. So I'm, I'm interested kind of to, to wrap up a little bit. I'm wondering how you feel about the position that you've taken for yourself in the field with your work, which you're obviously incredibly passionate about and seem to really enjoy. Um, because I mean, normally we sort of split a little bit about talking about, you know, more personal kind of aspects of your life and people's work. But I've just been sitting here listening to you because I feel like I'm seeing your person. This is not just hearing somebody talk about the articles that they write. Like I'm, I'm seeing the way that you're involved with the challenges and all of this. So I, I'm wondering how you feel about yourself in the position you've created within the academic or the Gestalt world in particular. Well, I'm very happy with it. And I realize that I still have to continue updating because I went to graduate school a long time ago. And I learned these things, Masterson's dad, he died in 2010. He was still updating to the end. Mm -hmm. And I plan on still updating my skills and the stuff I haven't read. And I'm exposed to different things. And I really like that. Yes, this is what, I, I, I play games. I get projects for myself. For mm -hmm. a while, I did the taxi care project in New York. What was the taxi care project? I realized, that there were a lot of unhappy taxi cab drivers who were being yelled at and underappreciated. And then it was Uber drivers. And they really were paid very little, worked very hard for many hours. And most people in New York were kind of abrupt with them. So I decided that some taxi drivers I would show appreciation to if they did anything I could appreciate. And if they had a problem, we would talk about it because they would spontaneously tell me the problem sometimes as soon as they found out what I was. So <laughs> Taxi Jeff, my project was to, to make happier taxi drivers by paying attention to what they did good. I think people are underappreciated in the world. Mm -hmm. And that most of the time is not spent with, with the people who we love, really. We're spent in these day-to-day -day interactions with people we don't know. So I have a waitress project going on now in Sarasota. And to make waiters and waitresses happier and more appreciated and make these interactions with them positive. I go for the win-win. I want to feel good. I want them to feel good. I try and find what we have in common. And then I find what's real about them that I can see and appreciate. And so this is my life. That's what I'm doing when I'm not doing that. And I was doing that this morning in First Watch, having breakfast with my girlfriend, Francesca, who moved to Sarasota to be with me. She was an associate member of the New York Institute, which she got into to support me and to find out mm -hmm. about Gestalt. So it really, for me, is no line between pre-psychoanalytic systems of personal growth, <laughs> tarot, spiritual evolution. I read Sufi stories. I read Zen Buddha stories. I read Hasidic stories, um, Christian mystic stories. It's all the same to me. I like people. I want people to have dignity, live well, have what they need and be happy. And if I can be a part of that, I'm happy. And it's fun for me. See, it's really fun mm -hmm. when, it go, when, it, when, it, when it's cooking. Right. And I have a homeless project. There's some homeless people here who are mine. You know, I can feel their energy. I can, and one of them turned out to be a former craftsman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I support them when I see them. Now with COVID, they're not hanging out as much. Right. So I haven't seen the guy I like, or I'd learn people's names. And, you know, people want to be treated with dignity. And I think if we treat everybody with dignity and everyone feels safe and that they can be themselves within the law, within the reasons, within a reasonable range, then we will have a better world. And I can't do it on the big stage. I don't think I'm meant to be a politician or to run an organization, really. I can do it with my people, the people who come to me, the people who are attracted to my writing, the people who reach out to me, the people I see every day. And I think we all see people every day and we all have something to offer them. 
and that this could be something we all sign on to do. And I'm so appreciative of you doing this project, the generosity of you and what's the other one, Camilla? Camilla. Mm -hmm. Camilla, to do this, these many, many interviews for the world, for us, that I was reluctant at first, as I said, because I'm a private extrovert. Mm -hmm. I don't ha have a lot of selfies. Like I said, I expected to be a nice sheep and be right. taught. And I turned into a sheep herder, uh, a sheep protector, um, and um, lots of things like that. Mm -hmm. So thank you for doing this, Heather. It's really remarkable, and thank Camila. And I see this as one of your many contributions. And yeah, I, I, I identify with the way that you're describing the work and the playing and the just doing it and blurring some lines and just not really just going for it. So you I appreciate that. I'm you glad you warmed up to it, and I'm glad that you spent some yeah, time here today. And you did the best workshop <laughs> that I've ever gone to in my life. No, having heard the list of the workshops you've gone to, I'm... <laughs> and I've been to, th I don't know, I can't say thousands. That might not be accurate. It might be accurate. It might actually be. <laughs> yeah, you know, because I've been going to conferences and workshops, yeah. Ericksonian therapy workshops. I used to go to all the time, short-term therapy workshops, gestalt therapy workshops, object relations workshops. That was a great thing. And that, it was great because it brought together humor, enjoyment, and we got to be our personal selves. But I also learned about myself. I hate clowns. And you had us at the end <laughs> be a clown, but you said the thing that made me able to do it. You said, pick a part of yourself and exaggerate it or something like that. I don't know yeah. if I got it right. And so I became a vampire clown. Yes, you did. And, and you were and perfectly I, matched with a professional clown. And is, he said that you were one of the best clowns he's ever worked with. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I am. Thank you. People laugh. So thank you again, Heather. And thank you for doing this interview with me. And I hope the people who see it enjoy it and get Thanks. something out of it. I'm sure they will. Thank you. It's really been a pleasure.